pathophysiology of asthma, bronchial asthma. So when we think about bronchial asthma, it is, you can say it is defined as a air with hyper-responsive with bronchial constriction and it is relapsing. It's a long-term or chronic and it is also plus it's a reversible condition. So let's try to understand what caused all this uh, pathology that is found in asthma. So first of all, let's understand what happens. What is the end result in long-term asthma? So number one is that if you go from inside to outside, in so you can see number one is formation of mucus plug. The mucus gland is hyperplasia. Okay, and as a result, there is plenty of mucus that is obstructing the lumen. So because of that obstruction, asthma is an obstructive disorder. So number two, if you go from inside to outside, this is number one. There is mucus plug with attached inflammatory cells. Number two, the goblet cells will be hyperplastic. So there will be a lot of goblet cells. So goblet cells and this mucus gland, they have become hyperplastic. As a result, there is increased mucus production is there. Then outside number three, there is inflammation. Where is the inflammation? There is a submucous layer in the lamina propria. There, this is the layer, this is the epithelium and this is the layer where there is the inflammation takes place. And number four, there is, if you go from inside, there will be thickened smooth muscle. This smooth muscle will be thickened. Number five, there will be the basement membrane. Okay, this is number four, because thickened basement membrane, this basement membrane is quite and quite thickened because of the sub-epithelial fibrosis. You can see this is quite thickened. This fibrosis takes place. And number five is the thickened smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is being thickened. It becomes thick and as a result there is constriction. But don't forget to write the number six is always normal parenchyma. That's what it differentiates a uh, regular asthma from a COPD cases because there is a parenchyma is not involved in asthma. Okay, so this is one, two, this is mucus plug, goblet cell metaplasia, then inflammation in submucous layer. This is the whole inflammation which we'll discuss. And then thickened basement membrane, thickened smooth muscle, and normal parenchyma. So that is what is uh, the pathology of bronchial asthma. Now let's try to understand the pathophysiology. What happens? In there okay so let's say someone is going out and is exposed to an allergen for the first time so what will happen when it happens for first time so for the first time so when an allergen comes so when an allergen comes it will be taken up by dendritic cells it will be taken up by dendritic cells so any allergen it will be taken by dendritic cells which you can see here it will be taken by dendritic cells so these dendritic cells will process that allergen into peptides. It will convert into peptides and it will take into the local limb nodes. It will take into the local limb nodes, local limb nodes for processing which we call antigen presenting cell and there there will be production of lymphocytes and don't forget the most important key player in bronchial asthma is the so along with the lymphocyte productions what the dendritic cells do they produce t helper cells type 2 so in a normal regular in a normal patient person who is not asthmatic normally in the airways we have t helper cells type 1 but what happens in asthma there is this imbalance and there is over and over recruitment of t helper 2 cells by releasing some cytokines here yeah. it releases some chemo attractants and as a result, there is lots and lots of recruitment of T helper 2 cells. So once the T helper 2 cells is formed, then it becomes a series of the inflammation process starts after this. So once this now T helper 2 cells formed, so what will happen? So along with that, so what happens? The general cells, they also influence here. After this, there is influence of B cells, they stimulate and as a result there is production of IgE, immunoglobulin E. So when there is immunoglobulin E is produced because of this mediators they release interleukin 3 and interleukin 4, this lots of immunoglobulin E are produced. So what does immunoglobulin E do? 
So once they are entered to a sin, once they are produced, they get hooked up. Where? They get hooked up into the mast cells. So this is immunoglobulin E. So these are immunoglobulin E. This is all green is E. So once the immunoglobulin E it goes to the mast cells and it, it has because it has receptors. The mast cells have immunoglobulin E receptors where it attaches. So once it is attached to the mast cells, it is hooked up with the mast cells. The mast cells, what it do? It it's like a key entering into the lock. And once this IgE attached to the receptors in the mast cells, then the mast cells will liberate its contents. What are inside the mast cells? Is muscle basically liberate its prostaglandins? Prostaglandins D2, histamine, which are mainly responsible for all the sources of inflammation. So once the histamine and prostaglandin D2 is released, it is responsible for the inflammation part. So that was the initial response. So what happens in initial response? The most important factor in the initial response is that the mast cells are loaded with IgE. The mast cells are loaded with IgE. Okay, that's what takes place in initial exposure. Now let's say this child is, after a few days, it is re-exposed to the same allergen. So when someone is re-exposed to the same allergen, that, that person has already the mast cells with plugged in IgE. Now once those mast cells this is already hooked up with IgE, what will happen? These mast cells will now recruit these potential leukocytes like eosinophils and neutrophils. They will recruit these eosinophils and neutrophils. So this reaction will take place, so there will be T helper, tooth cells, and now there is eosinophils, there is neutrophils, and there is a series of inflammation starts. So most important thing to be noted is that when this eosinophil is produced, now remember this eosinophil is particularly found in bronchial asthma, it's not found in COPD cases. So once this eosinophil is produced, you can see in this diagram, this epithelium, the airway epithelium, the epithelium that is present in the airways, they are displaced. They are displaced. They are, the epithelium becomes very friable, which can be easily dislodged. So once this epithelium is dislodged, this epithelium are dislodged, what happens? The nerve endings, the unmalignated nerve endings beneath this epithelial cells, they become exposed. So which do, so who do the thing that dislodgement of epithelium? Eosinophil particularly. This eosinophil, they destroys this epithelium. They makes it very very friable. So epithelium is also found in the mucus. So when you do the bronchoscopy, you can find the mucus laden with eosinophils also, because eosinophils and the epithelium. So once this epithelium is displaced, this unmyelinated nerve endings they become sensitized, and a series of reflex occurs. So then it will go up to the medulla and then come back which are cholinergic nerve endings and release acetylcholine. So the whole parasympathetic nerve ending is parasympathetic nerve fibers are stimulated which can cause bronchoconstrictions. So that's why the treatment of bronchial asthma, alternative treatment of bronchial asthma is also anticholinergic because if we can stop this cholinergic nerve endings, this reflex, then we can stop this bronchoconstriction. But when this cholinergic reflex is activated, it not only do bronchoconstriction, it can also do vasodilatation of these airways and plasma leakage. Plasma leakage. So because of plasma leakage, there is edema in the airways. So once this nerve is activated or the cholinergic reflex is in the scene, then it not only do the bronchoconstriction, it can also cause plasma leakage and edema and there is lots and lots of this whole thing becomes congested. Along with that, we should know that though there are less receptors, there are, there are also beta 2 receptors here, okay, which are anti to cholinergic, which do which promotes bronchodilation. So that is the main part of treatment. So treat, main stay of treatment is always beta 2 adrenergic receptor when we ag agonist beta 2 agonist like salbutamol or salmitriol. So what they are, who, what these drugs are do? They are beta 2 agonists. So when we are stimulating the beta 2 organist, this bronchoconstriction is inhibited and as a result there is relaxation of the smooth muscle. As a result there is bronchodilatation. Okay. 
So what happens along with this? So you can see what are the pathology as you say, if you go from the here, there will be goblet cell hyperplasia, which is not shown here. There will be mucus gland hyperplasia. There will be thickening of the basement membrane. And then there will be vasodilatation of the blood vessels, plasma leakage leading to edema, and there is bronchoconstriction. So why did this take place? This takes place in the lamina propria. The cholinergic reflex is activated, the, but the beta-2 agonist receptors, they are suppressed. Okay, so this cholinergic reflex, which is mainly leakage for edema and vasodilatation and the plasma leakage from the blood vessels, also it is also related to the angiogenesis also. So when you say pathophysiology of asthma, it's a very very complicated process. Okay, so what are the key players? What are the things that you need to remember here? So key players are here. Number one is dendritic cells. Number one is dendritic cells. So number two is T helper type 2 cells. Third is mast cells. Fourth is eosinophil. Fifth is neutrophil. So these are the basic key players which do the whole thing of bronchial asthma. So as a result, now what happens? What is the effect of ultimate effect of this pathology or the pathophysiology? So you can see there will be bronchoconstriction. There will be bronchoconstriction. Then there will be edema of the airways. Edema of the airways. Then there will be subepithelial fibrosis or thickening of basement membrane. Subepithelial fibrosis. Cholinergic reflex, and lots and lots of mucus production, which is play a major role in the obstructive airways, obstructive lung disease. Now, when we say asthma, we divide asthma classically. We classify, how will you classify? We divide asthma into two types: atopic and non-atopic. We divide asthma into two types. Or you can say extrinsic or atopic or intrinsic non atopic. So you have to understand this concept that when we say atopic, what atopic is the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction when there is increased production of IgE. Okay, this is the type 1 hypersensitive reaction. There is increased production of IgE and they are susceptible to those allergens, to those allergens where which, which are actually harmless. Okay, so these are genetic conditions and they have a typical, uh, the typical phenomenon in the body that really leads to hyper immunoglobulin E release leading to allergic reactions. So type 2 or the intrinsic or non-atopic are basically drug related, very commonly is aspirin. So which are the drugs that can, which is very commonly asked in the exams, which are the drugs that can cause bronchial asthma or that can exaggerate bronchial asthma. One is aspirin, second is beta blocker. Now if you see the beta blocker, we see beta 2 agonist, it does bronchial relaxation, right? It is a bronchial relaxation thing. That's why we give beta 2 agonist, not antagonist. So if you beat, if you block the beta 2 agonist, if you are giving a beta blocker drug, then what will happen? It will lead to bronchoconstriction. So it can exaggerate. So that as a medical student, you must know that never give any sort of beta blocker drug to a asthmatic patient. Next is aspirin, which is very very common. Aspirin induces asthma. Now what is the pathophysiology be behind that? Now listen. We know that when this arachidonic acid is converted to prostaglandins or it can go, arachidonic acid can go by two parts or it can go for leukotrienes. Leukotrienes. So this is Cox pathway, this is leukotriene pathway. Now, if you are giving aspirin, it will block this pathway. So when you give aspirin, it will block this pathway. So when you block this pathway, this pathway will be exaggerated. So most of the arachidonic acid, they will be converted to leukotrienes, like leukotrienes D4, C4. 
So when the liquid trans D4 and C4 are producing excess amount without any control, they have an ability, they can do bronchoconstriction. That is one more pathological thing. Okay, that's why aspirin can produce or exaggerate bronchial asthma cases. The next is that, so what are the risk factors? So in the intrinsic non-atopic asthma, what are the risk factors? Risk factors can be anything, it's like dogs, waste cats face or animals or pets it can be caused by occupational asthma is also one variety where there is exposed to continuous exposure to some occupational dust materials and what else can be exercise it can be induced by exercise exercise stress cold all this comes into intrinsic non-atopic asthma okay so atopic is a genetic condition that has increased ig productions so when you have to write in the pathophysiology of asthma, remember when the allergen comes, it will first stimulate the D cells. And when he is repeatedly exposed, he will directly come and allergen will directly stimulate the mast cells. So it's almost shortcut this part. Okay. So first timer allergens will come and it is received by the dendritic cells. Okay. So dendritic cells. They will receive it, they will process it, and they will they'll recruit T helper 2 cells, and as a result, this so dendritic cells will then, this dendritic cells will receive stimulate T helper 2 cells, also it lead to, don't forget, this lead to production of I immunoglobulin E. So this immunoglobulin will be hooked up with these mast cells. So that's a procedure that takes place first times. So when you are repeatedly, a second time, when you expose, then it will not take a long time to achieve this inflammation. To, it will just stimulate the mast cells which are already attached to the IgE and so there will be lot and lot of neutrophils and eosinophils will be recruited which will cause epithelial damage, cholinergic reflex will be activated, edema will be there, mucus gland hyperplasia, mucus secretions will be there, the bronchoconstriction will be there and together it will cause wheeze, difficulty in breathing, dyspnea, bronchoconstriction, tightness in the chest, all those signs and symptoms will appear. So that's why treatment is basically within the treatment we give sevasortectin beta agonist which is this drug we are trying to relax the bronchial bronchial okay we are trying to counter this cholinergic reflex so that is the mainstay of pathophysiology of asthma and 